Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church on this Lord's Day. We thank God for your presence. We appreciate the visitors. We thank God for his blessings with some rain and well, God's been good to us, and it's good to be in God's house today, and we welcome every one of you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. Now, I hope we can be an inspiration to you today, and if you know of someone that's a shut-in and disabled to be in God's house today, and you're out there in the radio listening audience, if you get on your phone and call them and have them to tune in and get the Northside Baptist Church Hour, I believe you'll enjoy the singing and we'll preach to them what thus saith the Lord God. You'll be doing them a favor and us as well. So I hope you do exactly that. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 2 for the reading of God's Word today. Now, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you tune to this station where you're now listening, you can get the daily broadcast at 12 o'clock noon each day, Monday through Saturday. I was greatly surprised and amazed at the way the broadcast came into North Carolina where we were in a meeting last week. The pastor up there said that many, many people listen to us daily up there and I appreciate it. The station came in real clear and we appreciate that very much. That's up near Cassius, North Carolina, not very far from Sylvia. And we just thank God for the privilege of getting the gospel out in that vicinity and in whichever way the direction the broadcast carries the message and the distance thereof. Now, we do have cassette tape. We tape our Sunday morning programs. Now, the program this morning, singing and music, will be taped, and it will be available on cassette tape, and we send these out for a gift of $3 each, and the money is used to help pay for our radio time, and if you don't have a cassette tape recorder, you ought to try to get you one. I'm talking to you out in the radio listening audience, maybe some of you shut-ins. There are a lot of good tapes available, a lot of good music. It can be a blessing to your hearts. And if you write in and request the tape by number of our title, we'll get them in the mail to you. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. You pray for me and write to me next week. During these days of vacationing for a lot of people, hot summer days, seem like people many times forget the Lord's work in this respect. And we want you to stand by this home mission work to the glory of God. We want to try to do a good job for the Lord. I believe we ought to try to do our best in getting out the gospel. Like Brother Brock, he's doing a wonderful job at Camp Maranatha. We want to do a wonderful job on the radio and pastoral work and evangelism that we're in. And you pray for us. I'm reminded of this little boy. His name was William. His father died. And he went out to seek a job. And he went to a, a soap maker in those days. This is many years ago. And he said to the soap maker and the candle maker, said, I come to get a job, sir. Could you give me a job? He said, well, I might be able to use your son. He said, my name is William. And I'm 16 years old. My father passed away and my mother needs help. The man said, yes, son, I'll see what I can do for you. I make soap and candles, and I'll hire you, but there's uh, two or three things I want you to do, son. When you make a cake of soap, you make a full cake, and do your best, and likewise with the candles. And then you, whenever you tell a person you'll do something, then you do what you promise. And in addition to that, you give God 10% of your income. That tithe belongs to the Lord. William said, William said, yes, sir, I'll do that. And you know who that William was? William Colgate. He became a millionaire. Now, my son, Paul Edwards, our music director, is in cabinet building business. And he does a beautiful work. And I said the same to him. I said, son, when you build cabinets for people, do a beautiful job. Build beautiful cabinets, do good work. And then, son, you, whatever you tell a person you'll do, you do it at all costs. Your word is your bond, what you promise that you do. And then I said, son, give God his tenth out of your money that you clear in your business and you can't miss it. There's no way you can miss it in that respect. And God will bless you. And I trust he's doing that. I believe he is. And so anybody, I say that for anybody in business or on your job, do your best. Be honest. Let your word be your bond. 
and give God his part of your income and you just can't go wrong in that respect. And I hope you'll take that to heart. I won't charge anything for that. I'll give you all of that free. And that's for your own good. My mother used to give me medicine free, like cast oil. That was my own good, you know. Didn't like it too much, but uh, it did me good, Brother Brock. And <laughs> so sometimes we had to pass on a little something to do people good, whether they like for us to make mention of it or not. Now in Mark chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, and again, that is Jesus, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word of God unto them, or preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? What is it easy to say to the sick of the palsy? Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, and took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Now I'm speaking to you today on this subject, the quartet that raised the roof on the house. We have here a quartet that raised the roof off of this house. No doubt you've heard of a lot of good quartets in your lifetime. and I'm talking about maybe singers and quartets of other varieties. But beloved, these, this quartet here is very unique. They would not take no for an answer. And they were determined to get this man to Jesus Christ if they have to, had to raise the roof off the house. That's exactly what they did. I don't know their names. It's four of them. Uh, probably maybe their names were faith, hope, love, and charity. I don't know. But anyway, we have these four men here doing a job, a marvelous job, a men that were no quitters, a men that was willing to do that which was right, determined to do it, and they did it. Now, of course, in this narrative, you have the helpless, the helpers, the hinders, and the healer. But I want to mention something about these uh, fellows here and about what happened here in the narrative I read to you. Number one, I want you to notice in verse one that Christ is in the house. Now, Capernaum is a beautiful place. I've been there many, many times. I've actually preached there at the old synagogue there at Capernaum. And it's a very beautiful place. And Jesus came here in Capernaum. And he went into this house. And when Jesus Christ is in the house, things are different. Now, things can be different in your home if Christ is there. I may be speaking to someone today. You and your wife have been fussing out there in the radio listening audience, been fussing on the children, calling about something. Maybe some of you might have a headache because you drank too much of that stuff you call booze or beer or wine last night. Maybe you stayed out too late in devil mid and you're not feeling good this morning, you're irritable. And uh, you're discouraged, despondent, and you don't know what to do. I can recommend to you what to do. Let Jesus Christ come into your heart and into your home and he can solve these problems. In the past few weeks, there's been a great number of suicides committed in the Athens area. People are taking their own lives. Now they've been despondent, discouraged, maybe some on dope or whiskey or whatnot. And they say, well, what's the use? I think I'll just go ahead and commit suicide. And they say, that's the way out. That's not the way out. That is not the way out. I may be speaking to someone today, you're very despondent. You've thought about taking your own Here we find Christ is in the house. You have Christ in your home today. Do you have a Bible there? Is Jesus Christ living in your heart, there in your home? Christ in the home. That makes a difference in the home. I've known homes of drunkards where the dad spent his money for whiskey and come in and whip his wife and children. And Jesus would come into his heart, into his home, and change the home completely. God can do that. 
maybe that's your need today there in your home is for Jesus to come in. Number two, I want us to notice where Christ is doing business, people gather together. And verse two, and straightway, many were gathered together insomuch there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. So usually where God is doing business, people gather. We find that to be the case here. And they gathered there to hear Jesus, to see some miracles performed. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor law given from between his feet unto Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now that's what we find taking place here. Shallow had come. That is Jesus, the Messiah. And now as he preached in this home, then people gathered in. So many people that couldn't get in the house. They filled the yard for maybe uh, yards, hundreds of yards away. They stood trying to get to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible said he preached the word of God unto them. The Bible didn't say he gave them a little essay. He didn't tell them how to pull some tricks and give out some gimmicks and and get a crowd. He didn't, he didn't say it. He preached the word to them. That's the dying new thou is the word to be preached. The Bible didn't say he gave them um, a little essay about the uh, Baptist program or whatnot. He said he preached the word. That's the cry and need of this hour. Preach the word. Young in the mountains of North Carolina last week, those mountain people came out hungry for the word of God, rejoicing and praising God. And we had a good meeting. They enjoyed the word. They loved it. They revel in the scriptures and God blessed. And we had a good meeting. Saw people saved. People come back to God. And we saw the word of God working again. As we preached the word, it worked. God used it to reach people. And people, of course, were stirred and blessed by it. Number three, let's notice the palsied man in verse three. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy. Now this man here is a type of a sinner. He's a palsied man. He's helpless. He cannot walk for himself or help himself and he needed help now this bed speaks of helpless and, and suffering no doubt the type of bed indicated here implies that he was very very poor and he was very much cast down matthew said about him in chapter 9 and verse 2 where jesus said son be of good cheer evidently this man was very much cast down very despondent and there he had been in this condition for a long time Maybe he never dreamed he'd ever walk again. And so something happened to him that straightened him out. This man was a poor man, a suffering man, a helpless man, which is a type of sinners today without the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's move on to thought number four. And I like this one, and that is he had four neighbors, four friends that were willing to do something about this man's condition. In verse 3, they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. No doubt these neighbors got together, and they said, Now, look, we need to try to get our neighbor to Jesus. We understand that he's healing people, and if we can get him to God, he can be healed and be saved, and we need to try to do something about that. Now, they agreed. They agreed to uh, try to get the man to Jesus. Sometimes it's hard to get people to agree on things, Someone said the best way to operate with a committee is to appoint a committee of three and then have a meeting and ask two of them to stay at home and then have the meeting with the one. You get something done for God. Over in the Holy Land just a few weeks ago, we were looking there at one of the ugliest camels I think I'd ever seen. Long neck, long legs. I mean, he was an ugly thing. And this thought came to me. I said to Dr. Waters, I said, Dr. Waters, you know what I believe that animal is? He said, no, what is that, Brother Edwards? I said, I believe that's just a horse put together by a Baptist committee. And he said, well, I may have to agree with you there. But anyway, sometimes you get committees that can't very well get the job done. Had Noah had a committee, he could not have gotten the ark built, I'm sure, like God wanted it. They'd have been fussing about the way to build it. God usually calls a man and gives that man wisdom and directs that man to do the job God wants him to do. And then God gives him helpers to go along with him to do the job. But here we find four men working together. You reckon they were Baptists? They were working together, four of them. I don't know. Might not have been. But anyway, they were working together. The Bible tells us. They got together. They agreed there's a job to do. And in order to do the job, we must work together. Now we're working together and getting out the gospel. 
Now, Brother Brock mentioned the fact of his camp over here. And, of course, this church helps out a monthly on that camp. And occasionally we uh, give a little extra in time of need and so forth. And uh, we have a part in that camp. So we're working with Brother Brock and Sister Brock in getting those children saved and taken care of. He can't do that by himself. He has to have help. And we are working together with him in that respect. Now I'm glad we could have a little part in it. Like this radio ministry. We're now in our 36th year of daily broadcasting from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. And these 36 years of daily broadcasting, God has laid upon the hearts of people to help us out financially to keep the program on the air. And he's kept it on the air now almost 36 years daily. And I praise God for it. God gave us helpers in that respect. I couldn't do it myself. If it, didn't, it depended entirely upon me to take care of it financially, I'd have to go off today. I just couldn't do it. And God takes care of that situation. I'm glad he does. He moves up on the hearts of his people. And all the good that's done, souls are saved, hearts are blessed. Those that help keep the program on the air will have a part in it and be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. God keeps the record. Now, these people work together. They had a great determination. They had great faith. You know, you got to have that determination. The Bible says you reap if you faint not. I reminded the little boy, he, he uh, loved cookies, and his mother told him time and again to stay out of the cookie jar. And so he one day he said, to Mom, I, I, I just, uh, I want some cookies. She said, Son, now what you have to do is whenever you are tempted to get in that cookie jar, just say, Satan, get behind me. He said, All right, Mom, I'll try that. And so the next day she caught him in the cookie jar. She says, son, I thought I told you to tell Satan to get behind you when you really wanted to cook it. He said, mama, I did. And you know what he did? He said, he shoved me right into that cookie jar. Well, a lot of times, you know, there's no way around. We, we are determined to do what we're going to do regardless. And so that little boy was determined to get a cookie. He might have been the same one that eased up there and his mother caught him with a cookie and said, son, what are you doing with that cookie? He said, mama, I just up here kind of smelling of them a little bit. One got hung on one of my tooth teeth and so uh, he got a cooker after all didn't he but anyway these men got together they had great faith in verse 5 when Jesus saw their faith he saw the faith of the four men and he saw the faith of the poor paralytic the man on the uh, blanket they were bringing in on the cot or whatever Jesus saw their faith Matthew said in chapter 9 and verse 29 according to your faith be it unto you these men believe with all their heart that if they could get this man into the Lord Jesus, that God would do something for him. They believe that. You can make them doubt that because they went all the extra trouble to get him there. They believe if they got him there that God would do something for him. Several years ago, I was in a tent meeting in Greenville, South Carolina. We had a little boy to attend the meeting about nine years old. God saved the little fella. And he came to me night after night and said, Preach Edwards, I'd like for my mother and daddy to get saved. His mother and dad were only about uh, 28 or 29 years old, around 30, something like that. And I said, Son, we'd be praying, and maybe if they'll come to the meeting, they'll get saved. He said, Yes, sir, Preacher, I believe if they'll come, they'll get saved. I said, Son, now you need to keep working on them, and I'll keep praying. He said, I'll, I'll sure do that. And so he kept working on his mother and dad, and the last night of the meeting, I saw him coming in. They came with a big smile on his face, walking between mother and dad. And when they sat down under that tent, while well, he sat down between them. And as I preached, he'd look at one, then he'd look at the other. Man, he was enjoying that. He had got mom and daddy there, and he was just so dead sure that they'd get saved if he got them there. And you know when we gave that invitation? Mother and dad came down and got saved. Little boy came back and knelt with them down the sawdust trail, fell on their knees and got right with God. Now that little boy believed with all of his heart if he could get his mother and dad into that tent meeting and they would hear the word of God like he did, they too would get saved. And God honored that faith. Now God honors faith. Now some of you people sitting here, if you'd go out and bring some of your lost loved ones and let them hear the gospel, they might get saved. They just might do that. Now this little boy, his, his, his parents got saved. Now these four men, they said, if we can get this man to Jesus, we believe that God will do something for him. You couldn't make those men doubt that. They wouldn't have gone to that trouble had they not believed that Jesus would heal the man, do something for him. And so they got him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number five, I want you to notice the opposition that they incurred on the way. The opposition. 
Notice the first opposition came from the crowd in verse 4. They could not come nigh him for the press. Now when they came up that little dusty road, bringing this sick man on a bed, there they saw a crowd of people. Now it's very difficult for one man to nurge his way through that crowd to get to this house. Very, very difficult. How much more difficult would it be for four men with a sick man on a blanket bringing him to Jesus? How much more difficult would it be to get him through that crowd? So they had great opposition in getting that man to Jesus. That mob of people, no doubt they said, I wonder how in the world are we going to get this man through that mob, through that crowd of people? But they did. They were determined to do it, and they did. They got him to Jesus. That is a great opposition. They determined to overcome it, and they did. Secondly, we find opposition coming from the scribes. In verses 6 and 7, And there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now when this quartet raised the roof off the house and let the man down before Jesus, and Jesus forgave him of his sins, then the scribes and the Pharisees, they didn't like it. They began to murmur and complain about it. Now this quartet moved through the crowd, raised the roof off the house, and let the man down in front of Jesus. They couldn't get him through the door, so they said, we'll just raise the roof off the house. We're going to get this man to Jesus, and that's exactly what they did. Now they had great opposition from the scribes and Pharisees. The greatest opposition today to the true gospel of Jesus Christ you will find in the religious world. Now you must remember that. In the world today you have millions and millions and millions of people all involved and tied up in religion that know not God. The greatest opposition Jesus had in his day came from the religious people. The greatest opposition Paul and the other apostles had came from the religious people. The greatest opposition today that the man of God has comes from religious people. While this poor cusser out here and drunk and man that hangs around the juke joint, while he doesn't uh, bother God's people too much or God's man, it's that a religious crowd wants to fuss and argue and, and try to keep people away from God. That's why the devil works. Somebody says, well, I know where the devil is. He's down yonder at the dance hall. Well, all he has to do is just peep over the hill and be sure everything's going good. He lets that crowd go. He's got them anyway. He wants to go to church and go where the gospel is preached to hinder the preaching of the word of God. He wants to do everything he can to keep people from getting saved and keep God's people from growing in grace and knowledge and cause divisions among them. The devil works in the religious field. He comes as an angel of light. And these old scribes and Pharisees, religious leaders of that day, reasoned in their hearts and said, well, this man's got no right to save anybody. This man has no right to forgive sins. This man has no right to heal anybody. And they argued about that. Now, the next opposition came from the man being sick himself. Now, this was a sick man. And it was very difficult to get him to Jesus being a sick man. They had to be very careful. And so that was a problem. But they over and overcame these problems and got the man to Jesus. Number six, I want you to notice a great Savior. This great Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, received the man. I'm glad that Jesus said to him that cometh unto me, I would in no wise turn away. The Lord will receive you if you mean business. And then in verse 5, he honored their faith. Jesus saw their faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He honored their faith. And immediately he arose, verse 12. Immediately he arose. Now Jesus didn't say, now you rise up on one elbow, get up on one foot, kind of sit up uh, gradually and kind of ease yourself up a little bit, kind of help him up there, fella, prop him up a little bit and see if we can manage some way to get him on his feet and tell him that something good's going to happen to him today and, and tell him to try to walk a little bit there and kind of help him along. No, no, that's not the way it happened. The Bible says immediately he arose. Jesus healed the man, he saved the man, and he healed the man, and the man got up off of that bed. Now, brother, he didn't linger there. He was glad to get up off of that bed, and he, and he arose a healed and a saved man. And then Jesus, of course, reading the thoughts of the scribes and Pharisees in verse 8, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason these things in your hearts? See, this was God. He could look right down into their hearts. He knew what they were thinking. And of course, they were doubting his deity. The battleground today is, who is this man, Jesus? Is he very God? 
is the Bible true? We know it is. We know he was very God. And so Jesus saw in their hearts that they reasoned among themselves. And then in verse 7, they said, only God can forgive sins. Well, they told the truth there, but they didn't realize they were telling the truth. Well, they didn't know Jesus was God. Now, Jesus forgave the man of his sins, and they said, only God can do that. That was true. Only God can pardon a man from his sins, but they didn't see him as God. Now, if you don't see Jesus Christ as God, you'll die and go to hell. That's why these Russellites, so-called Jehovah's Witnesses, are all going to hell because they don't believe that Jesus is God. They think he's just another man out there and he's not the real true God and they don't believe that Jesus is God. So they can't go to heaven. And anybody else that denies that Jesus Christ is God cannot go to heaven. He is the God-man. He is the Savior and he is the only way to heaven. And he said he was the Messiah. He said, I am God. And so you must believe that. You must believe in the deity of Christ. You can't deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Beloved, you can't do that and expect to go to heaven. God's people don't deny that anyway. Only religious sinners deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And so he said, only God can forgive sin. And verse 11, I say unto thee, arise. Arise, he said. I say unto thee, arise. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 9, the Lord our God belong unto Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. So the Lord our God had mercy and forgave. He can forgive our sins because He died for us and gives us power to walk because He rose again and lives forever. And Jesus told him now to get up and walk, and that He did. He kept on walking. Finally, they saw something unusual happening that day. In verse twelve, they were all amazed and glorified God. Said, "We never saw it on this fashion. Something very unusual." Luke records in Luke chapter 5 and verse 26, and they were all amazed and glorified God with fear with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. And when people get saved, you're going to see some strange things. You're going to see some amazing things, and you can glorify God. Now, this message today on the quartet that raised the roof off the house is cassette tape number 132. It's available for anyone that's interested in it. And I want to pass it on before I went off the air. Now, you may notice something strange that day. They saw a man, a, a ten-legged man. You may say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, here goes four men. They had two legs. This man had two legs made ten. And so they saw these ten legs come into the Lord Jesus Christ. Then they saw a quartet that wouldn't take no for an ass that raised the roof off of the house. And then they saw the lockjaw of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus gave them the lockjaw. There's not much they could say. And then they saw a man carrying a bed that once carried him. And that's different. And then they saw a man thanking God that he had been palsied, no doubt, because had he not been a palsied man, he might not have been saved. And he got saved and got a good case of healing. The psalmist said in Psalms 119, verse 71, It's good for me that I've been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Now I can say the same thing today. God struck me down many years ago and put me flat on my back. Had not God struck me down and put me flat on my back for several weeks, I might not have been saved. It's while I was flat on my back that my mother and the pastor there in Greenville, South Carolina came. And my mother already there, she put her arms around my neck when the preacher came over to try to win me to God after reading the scripture and praying. And she placed her arms around my neck and her tears fell on my face and the preacher took me with a hand. And they said, uh, Virgil, it's about time you were getting saved. And Mama said, uh, son, you won't find a better time than now. And there with my mother's arm around my neck, the preacher by my, had me by the hand, the Holy Ghost had me by the heart. I said an eternal yes to God. Now had not I been struck down uh, and uh, disabled to walk, I never would have probably been saved. Because I'd always run from the preacher, run from God, run from Christians. I didn't want to be around them, but God struck me down and put me flat on my back. And this verse of scripture means a lot to me. It was good for me that I'd been afflicted that I might learn thy statues. And then they saw a man going home, a new creation by the power of God. They saw these strange things happening that day. Many years ago in a little town, there was a well-known barber. Everybody thought a lot of him that uh, was a barber there in the little town. Only barbershop in town. His name was Sam. Everybody loved old Sam. He's a good barber, friend to everyone. Sam went out one day fishing and fell out of his boat and drowned. 
They went out searching for his body. They paid his highs a hundred dollars a day to get uh, divers to try to find his body. They searched for four days. They finally found Sam's body. And when they found his body and brought him in and people came in to take the last view of the body of Sam, a man they loved, they heard the preacher say this to Sam. The preacher said, Sam, had the people in this village loved your soul as much as they loved your body, you might not be in hell today. Let's stand our feet. Our Father, I pray that you'll take the message and that you'll use it and that you speak to many hearts and speak to many in the radio listed audience and had you in this invitation today and use the word of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen to me. David's going to play a couple of stanzas on the organ. As she plays, if you're here today unsaved, if you're here backslidden on God, if you're here and you want to join this church, the way we receive members, or if you want to come for any reason I haven't mentioned, if God prompts your heart to come forward, then I want you to come today. Would you do it while we wait on you? Would you come? If you want to get saved, come back to God, join the church. Or would you come? Or for any other reason? to help you. On Thursday night of our meeting last week, as a state trooper brought his family to the meeting, he had driven around over the state there doing his duty and said many times, many times, he heard us on the radio, and he said, if I ever came anywhere in the year, he's coming to hear me. He came and brought his family, a nice family. When we gave the invitation that night, his daughter, looked to be about 16 years old, began to weep. And the mother said, I don't know what's wrong with our daughter here. She's terribly upset. But God knew and she knew she wanted to get saved. She came forward and accepted Christ as a Savior. Would you be determined like this quartet? you're going to do something reach somebody for God be more faithful to the Lord do that which is right would you determine that today I hope you will <laughs> 